Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. Now, this is the weekly chart of the Dow, and we're going to get into a lot of market stuff. Then we're going to finish up with some religious stuff. So for those of you who aren't interested in that, you can tune out when we start that, just to give you a warning ahead of time. But uh, I wanted to look at a few things here with the ongoing crash in the stock market. The first thing I want to point out here on this Dow chart is the correction that occurred at the beginning of the, the bear market in uh, 2008 during the financial crisis and uh, how that pattern worked out technically. So uh, you can see that we got the top there and that was about uh, in, in the summer, got that top, and then you had a, a pretty steep correction. Uh, nothing like the move we've seen in the last two, three days, but uh, nevertheless a fairly steep correction. But the main thing I want you to look at here is the support point that it bounced off of. So you can see this arrow is pointing directly at that uh, bouncing off of the support line. Of course, this support line is established by the previous high of the last bull market, which was the NASDAQ bubble. It wasn't nearly as reflected in the Dow as it was in the NASDAQ, but they both topped around the same time, and that was right in here. Now, the test came, and you can see that we got a rally from that test point that went on actually a number of months. Is that gonna happen this time? I don't know. But what that does give us is that gives us the target. And that target is right here at about 14,000, um, give or take. So we want to get into the daily. Now, what happened in today's action? Let me take this arrow off of here. So when we zoom in here and look at what happened in the action, you can see, first of all, uh, we've got just an absolute textbook uh, violation of, of, of the rising trend line, textbook. And then you can see what happened. Now, yesterday on the lows, in the futures, I was watching it live, and the futures did touch 15,000. I think we actually saw 14s, but don't quote me on that. But we saw in the futures uh, a read all the way down at 15,000. Now, when the market opened, it opened much higher, you can see but uh, radical swings. Now, the other thing to note here is that this candlestick that we got from today, and the high today was about 16,300, and the low is about 15,650 uh, or so. Uh, so big, big swings in the market. But uh, this candlestick, um, I don't know if the term is engulfing candlestick, but you can see it's contained within the previous candlestick. So if we draw the spike here, it could be a spike bottom that we're looking at, but my guess is it won't be. My guess is we will have a continuation and we're probably gonna get down there, down near support, around 14,000, and probably get a bounce there. Now, if we don't get a bounce there, and that is possible, that can happen and has happened, it's rare, but if we don't get a bounce there and it slices through that like a knife through butter, then it's, it's doom time at that point. So let's jump over to the silver chart. And uh, the thing to notice, of course, the big thing with silver is that, let's clear off everything here is the divergence with gold. And we're going to look at that when we look at uh, the Marshall Swing article from Silver Doctors. But let's uh, go ahead and put on the gold-silver cross. We'll put the gold on top of it here. And let's, let's start out with, let's get out here where we are in the weekly. So you can see the divergence actually really occurred all the way back in... Uh, the 2011 top when we got that we got that $50 we got that $50 price in silver um, that was in the spring you can see or that was May 1st the, the May uh, smackdown and you can see that silver crashed and rallied a little bit but then gold 
came and topped there in that uh, September. So there was actually um, the good, uh, was it six months or so? Not quite six months, five months, four months. So that was the pattern that we have. And you can see from there, we just kind of, sorry about that. I'm having a problem with my indicators. So from there, we just kind of continued down in both of them. But you can see that that silver took a much more dramatic fall than gold did. And uh, that's where we get the divergence that we have. It was a gradual thing. You can see back in here, they were fairly tight. And then uh, silver just really went down hard. Gold didn't quite follow it and kind of drifted lower. So that's the long-term overlay of the two. Now, what we want to look at right now is the recent action. And you can see that in the recent action, uh, we have a lot more strength in gold than we do in silver. So silver's back down here in the, the mid-14s, around 1450 or so. And gold is up here. Gold is up here around 1150. So you can see pretty big divergence going on. And the, and the question is going to be, which way to resolve? I'm of the belief, and I've always held the belief, that the gold and silver will eventually meet up again. Uh, to, to the upside, I can't say which one will lead and which one will follow, but I don't think that a divergence between these two can go on forever. That's because of my fundamental belief in the idea that they are both monetary metals. Uh, silver is often spoken of as an industrial metal, but I think the thing that's going to move silver is going to be investor demand. That's going to be the thing that makes a difference. And for that reason, silver and gold are eventually going to move together. And of course, I think it's to the upside. So before we get over to some other things here, I want to go ahead and pull up the China thing. Uh, we'll start off with the the Chinese Yuan. Now there's more stories coming out about the Tianjin episode and then there's this an episode in Japan and uh, it, it does seem to me that there may be some type of covert warfare going on here. It's kind of scary. So here's the, uh, the Chinese Yuan. You can see that uh, We'll get down to the daily so you can see what happened. Uh, we're, we're going back towards more devaluation here. We had the devaluation, the episode in Tianjin, and then we had the, the Chinese kind of backing off. And now here we go. The, the currency is weakening against the dollar again. So let's pull up the Chinese stock market because that's one that's in the news a lot. The, the Chinese have become the whipping boy for Wall Street. If you late, listen to the, the latest Peter Schiff, Peter talks about the fact that, uh, that the Chinese market, well, this was before today, but Peter talked about the, the Chinese market and how uh, it was not down for the year. It is actually down, you can see. Uh, we're very, very close now down for the year, but you can see that uh, the stock market in China is back to a price that was in mid-December. So it's given back all the gains that it had. We're rapidly approaching a 50% decline in the Chinese stock market. And I definitely have to eat some crow on that. I did not think that the, the Chinese market would correct to this extent. I thought that the, that the Chinese stock market would correct down to right about in here and then turn around and rally. And you can see it kind of did that right in here and then it rallied and it crashed through it. I did not anticipate this. Do I still believe the Chinese stock market is a buy? Yes, if you're into that sort of thing. Of course, I'm not into that sort of thing. And uh, I don't have any stocks, no American stocks or Chinese stocks. But if you're going to 
be an investor in stocks, I honestly think that probably the Chinese stock market right now is a, is a great buy. I know that sounds crazy. Now let me do the overlay here with the Dow because I want to show you some of the arguments that are made about blaming China. So the first thing we want to notice here is that the crash that we had in the last financial crisis, you can see that China had a huge drop. Uh, China is the the candlestick bar and the Dow is the line chart. So you can see that China had a huge run up and a huge drop. They pretty much went together. But now that you can see with the current drop, China has pretty much already corrected. Uh, they've already corrected two thirds of the latest run. So they're almost done. Whereas if you look at the Dow all the way up here, the Dow has not really even started the correction on this run. So yes, you can argue that China is leading the Dow, but uh, I don't think it's fair to blame the Chinese. This thing is, is, is worldwide. And as I pointed out recently on a comment on Zero Hedge, you know that I covered the, the oil story and how the gasoline is just not coming down with the crude. Um, crude is still plunging the lows here. You can see we're at um, 39.68. And if you remember that chart that I showed you about refinery output, it's down 66%. So a lot of people have talked about a lot of conspiracies of something going on with the Saudis and, and Iran coming online and an attempt to destroy Russia and all sorts of conspiracy theories about oil. But in my mind, it's really a very simple explanation. It's that chart that I already showed you, which is the total output of US refineries is down 66%, two thirds from where it was. And it still is sitting down two thirds of where it was for a good 25 years. So the ongoing depression in the United States is for me a, a perfectly reasonable explanation of why the price of oil is so low. The economy is so depressed in the US and I think actually it's spreading to the rest of the world. So I'm a little bit uh, on the other side than most people. They say that the depression is spreading from China to the US. I'm actually, I'm actually believing that the depression is spreading from the US to the rest of the world. Now, the other thing is the action in the dollar, a huge move to the downside on the dollar. We talked about that with the 1987 crash and um, we didn't really have a corresponding thing in the financial crisis, maybe back here in 2006. So a dramatic move, that's showing up in the move in the Euro, uh, a pretty big spike, but especially a big drop in the Japanese yen. That had been declining for the longest time and you can see this dramatic move in the Japanese yen. So let's take a look at the compare silver prices. Uh, before we do that, let's let's jump over to the Bitcoin chart. This is important. I showed you this before. This is Bitfinex, and you can see that the Bitfinex chart dropped on the 19th, 18th, actually, from about 260 down to 160. So a huge percentage move. Of course, that move was not replicated in the BTCE. That's the Russian exchange, or in Bitstamp, the, that's the American exchange, or Huobi. That's a Chinese exchange. But nevertheless, Bitcoin does seem to be forecasting moves ahead of the other markets, except for perhaps silver. You could argue that silver actually forecasted this deflationary move in the other markets before Bitcoin did. So what is Bitcoin saying? Well, we'll probably want to go over to Bitstamp. Bitcoin is still falling, although we have a bit of a rally coming in right now. Uh, seems to be on pretty big volume, so we want to watch that uh, because Bitcoin seems to be a leading market indicator. As I said before, Litecoin is actually leading Bitcoin, so uh, keep an eye on the Litecoin US dollar chart. That's going to be a really important chart. So let's get over to compare silver prices just to look at the premiums real quick. We look at this a lot, but it's important to keep an eye on this. You can see the junk bags. Best price, 31% over spot. 
as I said before, utterly absurd. For the longest time, silver has, uh, junk silver has traded at or below spot for junk silver. You can see a big, huge premium over here on silver eagles. Uh, the singles are coming in at 25% premium above spot. That's for the singles. You're paying $18.50 for a silver eagle. And you've got the monster boxes over here. Best price. I'm sorry, that's a Philharmonic. Best price on the silver eagles, 24%. It's nine grand uh, and change for a monster box of silver eagles. So the premium discrepancy is continuing. And of course, for me, anytime premiums expand like that, that's a sign for me that the powers that be have pushed things about as far as they can push them. And however much lower they push them, premiums will just expand the other side. So that's where you get the point where the paper price just doesn't really matter anymore. So let's go over to the last thing here. Oh, one more thing. This is the blog. This is the Silver for the People blog and the administrative uh, panel. We're on today here, so we can't go by these numbers. But if you look at yesterday's numbers, we had 18,000 hits. Uh, you can see that's a record. Uh, why am I bringing this up? I'm bringing it up to show you that the perception is that uh, when fi a financial crisis is occurring, they come to the alternative news media, the silver sites, the alternative uh, whatever uh, sites. And that's important. And the reason why that's important is it shows you there is the perception that when things fall apart, uh, the safety... The, the place to go for safety is going to be the precious metals. At least that's what I take out of it. So let's get over to the Marshall Swing article. This is called, They Are Rearranging Silver to Crash Gold. So you get the same thing from Marshall Swing talking about the discrepancy that's going on right now between the silver and gold price. He says, folks, I've told you before many times, and I will tell you again now, get every single paper dollar you can get every legal way you can get it and get physical gold and silver now. Now, I, I, I can't agree with that more. I think you should have something in cash, but yeah, I have to agree. Do not wait. I have to agree with that. Those who are trying to time this crash will lose their shirts and start jumping out of windows. Now, I wanted to say something about that. It's really important. This is actually the first time and... You know, I can't really use myself as a barometer, but I will say that this is the first time for me that I have never, I thought I had the, sorry, I thought I had the arrow there. This is the first time I have never played with any puts. I, I'm not in the stocks at all. I don't have 15 cents in my stock market account. And in the past, many, many times I've played when the volatility has gone up. But I've become convinced over the years that when it really matters, when I'm finally right, when I have the home run, I'm not going to collect my winnings. They're going to shut it down. And uh, so it's a, it's a lose-lose. If you're, if you're wrong, you lose. And if you're right, you lose. Uh, the, as, as the computer said in war games, the only way to win is to not play at all. So that's how I feel about trying to do options or shorting stocks. I'm just not doing it anymore at all. And uh, that's one of the things, if I'm going to use myself as a contrary indicator, I'm going to have to say that taking that position now, which is the first time I've ever taken it, then maybe this is going to be the big one. So he says, those who are trying to time this crash will lose their shirts and start jumping out of windows. I couldn't agree more. My friends... They're crashing silver to rearrange the short and long mix while they're leaving gold alone for the moment to come back and kill it later. All my predictions for the last three years are coming true right before your very eyes. Every single one of them will become true. Now that's that's going to border on the hubris side, I'd have to say there. Folks, I've told you before many times, and I will tell you again now. Get every single paper dollar you can. Get every legal way you can. Get... Uh, get physical gold and silver now. So he gives us two charts. He gives us the gold chart and he gives us a silver chart. And you can see that divergence. It's pretty clear. Gold is definitely rallying into this financial crisis. Silver is getting hammered. 
Those who are trying to time this crash will lose their shirt, start jumping out of windows. My weekly commitment of traders report uh, is going to come out. So that's what he says. Now, what's interesting about this is this, and this is the religious stuff. This is the chart he gives, the official timeline for Daniel's 70th week. For those of you who aren't familiar with Bible prophecy, uh, just to put it briefly, most, I won't say King James only, but fundamentalists like myself, I am also King James only, uh, premillennial, pre-tribulational, dispensational, um, I can't really give you the definitions of all those, but basically the position is that the return of Christ um, occurs initially at the rapture, which is a big event that all the media loves to cover now. It's in, uh, it doesn't matter which TV show. There's shows about it. There's mentions of it. It's kind of interesting because it's something that only Christians talked about a good 10 or 20 years ago. But now it's all over the place. And it's a belief that when Jesus returns for his church, he's going to return in the air. Everyone who died in Christ will be raised from the dead. And everyone that's alive will be translated to an immortal body and join Christ in the air. And uh, that's the rapture. That's this event. Now, Marshall Swing is drawing out a timeline. And that has to do with the week's of uh, Daniel's, uh, the prophecy of Daniel about the 70 weeks of Israel. There's one week left that hasn't been filled. This is what's called this tribulation period. Now, apparently from this chart that Marshall Swing is, is putting up here, you can see that he's what I call a date setter. Now, the other thing, the other term is that I, what I call these people is newspaper exegetes. Uh, exegesis means to... Um, get information out of information. In other words, to get information out of the scripture. Uh, whereas a newspaper exegete is someone who gets information out of the newspaper and tries to fit it into the scripture. So, you know, people living during the rise of Adolf Hitler, uh, there were many of them that believed that Adolf Hitler was the Antichrist and Mussolini was the false prophet and the Pope, etc. Of course, we know that was wrong, but they believed it at the time. Now, date setters are people who believe that they can give the exact day or close to the exact day of when these events are going to occur. Now, that's a big stumbling block for a lot of people. We have a lot of cults that came out of that. Uh, two ones that you can think of specifically are the Seventh-day Adventists and the Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, of course, the Seventh-day Adventists are not as bad of a cult as the Jehovah's Witnesses who are strictly... Uh, heretical in that they deny the Trinity completely. Uh, Seventh-day Adventists are basically work-based uh, people. But what happened was when they were wrong, because these were ones who set dates, and when they set these dates, a lot of the followers sold everything they had. It's kind of like the church in Acts. Uh, they, they sold everything they had in Acts. They actually gave it to the apostles and Etc. But in these uh, cults, they sold everything they had, went up on the hills, actually when they had an exact date, went up on the hills to wait. You know, uh, I don't think they understood the concept of the rapture. Maybe they thought it was a return. They were to see it. So being up on the hills, that's going to help them out. Well, what happened? It didn't happen. And what did they do? Did they come out and say, we're wrong. We set a date. We never should have set a date. Setting a date is wrong. Jesus told us you can't set a date. No one knows. Not even the son, only the father. No, they didn't do that. They didn't admit they were wrong. They changed their story and made some theological modifications and that's where the cult began this is how cults begin so marshall swing uh is he right that maybe he could be right i would say it'd be random chance if he is but what he's showing here when you look closely is that it's 2015 uh this blue line which seems to be the beginning of the tribulation he shows global economic crash, 2015, start of the 70th week of Daniel. So he's putting these two exactly together. Now, the first thing that I would say is if you really honestly and truly believe this, that you knew that the start of the 70th week of Daniel is going to coincide exactly with the global economic crash, I'm assuming he believes in the rapture. Maybe I'm wrong. Correct me if I'm wrong then what is the point of stacking silver? I don't see any point at all. It doesn't even make any sense. So now a lot of people have quoted the verse, 
which says that people will throw their gold and silver in the streets in the day of the Lord. Well, that's true. They will. When everything in the earth is destroyed, including all the trees burned up and the ocean dies and everything like that, gold and silver isn't going to be worth much. But the point is, is that we don't know the future. We can't predict when this is going to happen. And you not only have a responsibility to prepare for your eternal future, but you also have a responsibility to prepare for your, uh, we'll say, terrestrial, terrestrial future. In other words, you have to provide for your family. And, and to do that in the coming environment, you're going to need silver and gold. So I can't for the life of me explain why Marshall Swing. And there's another guy that uh, Silver Doctors has on here, Bo, Bo Polney, I think is his name. And for some reason, maybe because it makes headlines, I don't know. These people make like to make exact predictions, and of course, when they go wrong, well, who knows what they're going to do? We'll have to watch. Um, maybe they'll be right this time. I don't think so. So back to the chart. the The Dow chart is telling me that we have more to go, and the big thing we're going to watch is this fourteen thousand area. At the rate we're going, we're going to be there quick. I don't think this bounce is the bounce. I think that this engulfing daily candlestick on today's action is telling us that we're going to go lower. I think we're at least going down to that 15,000 that uh, that we visited in the in the after hours on this day. And then of course the support is all the way down here around 142 14,000. That's where I think we're going to be going in the next couple of days. And again, that is not a prediction based on some certainty or some knowledge. That's just a prediction based upon my experience with charts and markets. Um, but again, if you're trying to make an exact prediction of the future and tell people, you know, it's time to head up into the hills and sell all your stuff, uh, it's just going to end in disappointment. And we'll talk to you next time.